when our kids are alive, it's important as parents to keep them alive. And once they're gone, it's important for us to keep their memory alive. So Elias was pretty much a normal teenager. I mean, he didn't want to go to bed at night. You know, it's like, Elias, it's time for bed, or, you know, it's late, you need to go to bed, you have school tomorrow, and I'd have trouble waking him up in the morning to go to school. For the most part, we thought he was a normal teenager. He, you know, he didn't want to go out with us often, but of course, I assume that most teenagers don't want to hang out with their parents, because, you know, we're not cool. So that was, you know, one of the things that, like, Okay, Elias, like, let's go. And, you know, he has two younger sisters, six and three. You know, not really much to hang out with. So, for the most part, he was a normal teenager. He never suspected anything. You know, I still pass by his room and imagine him there. Your life changes from one day to the next. I mean, in my case, it was from one minute. I saw him at 10.30. That was the last time I saw him, and um, 11.30, that was the last text I got from him, 11.36, I won't forget. And it just said, I love you. And then somebody knocked at my door at 12, and they told me that they had seen the post. And at first I didn't react. I saw the picture, I didn't read it. I saw the picture and I thought, what is he doing? And immediately I was upset, but I didn't read it. So I thought he's playing with guns, he's posting it, like what is he doing? And I ran up to his room and he wasn't there. And I ran downstairs and then that's when they showed it to me again, like stopped me and showed me like, look. And then I just freaked out. I mean, it was, I was just scared. I had never been so scared ever in my life and that's the thing that you fear most. I always used to think that that was my biggest fear, losing a child. It is. It still is. He just really had a great heart. He was a great kid. I think if, if you're struggling, it's the hardest thing is to just say you're struggling. And once you kind of get past that initial, like you saying, you know, this is, this is me. You say it out loud, accept it, and it kind of resonates or it's, solidified to where you're like, okay with that, this is me, this is what's wrong, but what am I gonna do next? Instead of just holding it all inside and not being able to tell somebody, I just think that aggravates it. And you being able to be yourself in all its flaws, you know, I mean, obviously no one is perfect. It's horrible because mental illness is the only illness that people are ashamed of. It's just stigmatized. Mental illness is just stigmatized so much that it's almost embarrassing to say, you know, I've been diagnosed with a mental illness. So I think that, I mean, I don't know because I've never personally struggled, except for now, you know, except for now. But it's different because if I say I'm depressed, then people say, okay, she has a reason to be depressed, right? She lost her son. If you say you're depressed, the automatic question is going to be why? Or like you said, what's wrong, right? People ask you what's wrong. It's okay not to be okay.
I just felt like I wasn't doing enough and I didn't I didn't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. If I don't do something, then I not only fail him, but I fail everyone else who may be feeling the way he felt at that moment. You know, if it's a second leading cause of death, somebody needs to be talking about it. Somebody needs to be doing something about it. So, I just think that these were the cards that I was dealt. And I don't want to be here, but this is what I got. And now it's my job to make the best of it and to use what, whatever heartache that, you know, this has brought to me and my family and to prevent it from happening to somebody else.